Coming up on DTNS, telemedicine is on the rise and maybe an option you didn't know you had. Inbox.ai could revolutionize customer service and we comb through all those iOS 14 revelations. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 10th, Mario Day, because M-A-R-10, uh, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the dark forests of southern Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. Uh, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were uh, just talking about Sarah's old electronic Snoopy game machine that she's Indeed restoring. We were. Which, by restoring, I mean you're going to get a battery for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Two triple to, what, what, what do we say? Uh, triple. Double. Triple A? C? Triple no, a? You, don't you need C or Ds? I don't just, know. Just uh, we'll, C. Yeah, not we'll triple C. Just the regular C. <laughs> also, we realize that we're all headed to Patrick's house if the virus gets out of hand, because he's the only one safe. You'll be uh, welcome. Get the, oh, thank you. That's very nice. Get the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member right now at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Uber has resumed testing autonomous cars in San Francisco. Two vehicles with safety drivers will be operating during daylight hours only. Uber's autonomous cars are only operating in autonomous mode in Pittsburgh and San Francisco in the U.S. Huawei will launch its P40 smartphone during an online event March 26. It previously had planned an in-person event in Paris. The P40 is expected to have new zoom capabilities on a significantly upgraded camera array. It will be the first P-series phone not to be allowed to use Google Apps and services because of U.S. trade restrictions. Bitdefender and a multi-university group led by Joe Van Buick independently discovered a new speculative execution vulnerability in Intel chips called Load Value Injection, or LVI. An attacker could exploit LVI to intercept data passing through the secure enclave. Uh, and even, this is new for some of these speculative uh, execution, or the speculative... Um, whatever you call them. Uh, why, why did that suddenly leave my brain? Speculative execution attacks. Uh, it can inject new information. They, it can not only take information, it can put new information and change the results of what's happening. Anyway, LVI is not a practical exploit in the real world. Intel has published a 30-page technical summary of LVI and how to mitigate it if you work in an industry that does think this is a concern. The Game Developers Conference announced it will stream recorded versions of talks from booked speakers for free March 16th through March 20th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time on Twitch. Organizers will also hold a virtual award ceremony for the Independent Games Festival and also the Game Developers Choice Awards. Microsoft will stream some of its own talks, including one about Xbox Series X and Project Cloud on March 18th. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what Sensor Tower is accused of doing, Patrick. Indeed, BuzzFeed News reports that analytics platform Sensor Tower has been collecting data from millions of people who have installed its VPN and ad blocking apps for Android and iOS. One app prompted users to install root certificates through Safari, bypassing restrictions with the promise to block ads in YouTube. The apps collected anonymized usage and analytics data, but did not say they were owned by Sensor Tower or that the data was fed to Sensor Tower. Sensor Tower says uh, that it didn't dis disclose ownership of the apps for competitive reasons. Right. Well, because they judge apps, they like they they sell data about which apps are the most popular. So I think what they were trying to say is like we didn't want the app people to think we were competing with them. We just were putting these apps out here to collect data. Uh, half of this story, I'm not that upset about uh, co collecting analytics as long as it was very clear that they were doing it. Uh, is fine. This this wasn't even necessarily for advertising. This was for analytics data that they send to say, these are the apps that are used the most often. Uh, there's some data analysis there. I think sometimes people get a little overreactive about this collection happening. What I don't like, the half that I'm really upset about is not telling people where the data was going. Transparency is key in any of these situations so that you can decide if you want to take part in that or not. And really, really, really don't like tricking people into installing root certificates that that's a no no you yeah. don't do that yeah i mean it's <laughs> that, just bad practice even if yeah. sensor tower maybe you know being a little underhanded about what apps it owned users should be a lot more clear about that anonymized data analytics data that helps sensor tower and could potentially help you know developers and and users depending on whether or not you use the service 
that in itself isn't the problem. The root certificate is because that's just it's just it's uh, bad practice to train users into thinking, oh, I should do this so that the app works. Agreed. Agreed. One hundred percent times. All right, we're in. We're in accord. Dyson. Dyson continues to diversify its beauty product line with a cordless hair straightener called Corral. Settings of 330, 365, or 410 degrees Fahrenheit can be used for fine or thick or even coarse hair. A flexible copper plate holds hair between the clamp and evenly distributes heat, meaning that hair stays in place better which also means that the tool can be used fewer times and expose hair to less chance of heat damage. If you've ever used a hair straightener, you know that it's only a matter of time before you see the results of the hair damage. The Corral's battery can charge from zero to 100% in 70 minutes, last 30 to 60 minutes on a single charge. The battery can also be disengaged to use with only a power cord that could be useful for uh, taking it on a long flight, for example. It's available now in gray with pink trim or purple with gold trim for... $499. I know most people probably still think of vacuum cleaners when they think of Dyson, but hair dryer, uh, curler, and now a straightener, which, which could also be used as a curler in, in certain ways. Uh, they really, we're really seeing Dyson move into the bathroom, uh, into the beauty care situation here. And, and this is, I don't know that this is a better hair straightener, except for the part where it has design it's more of a material design to distribute the heat if that really works then maybe if it doesn't damage your hair that is a good improvement yeah i i'm one of those people with a dyson vacuum cleaner uh it works really well uh i love that vacuum cleaner uh never loved a vacuum cleaner more than this one in fact it's kind of weird but you know the 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 i have really straight hair so hair straighteners aren't really my thing but the whole idea of you know, you think we think so much of tech products uh you know going wireless if it works if the battery lasts long enough it makes a lot more sense. It just cleans up the whole process of, you know, the office environment. Same thing for the bathroom. Right mm. now, and I've had so many bathrooms in my life, right now I have one outlet in my bathroom. And it's placed in a way where it's just like kind of inconvenient and sort of like hitting other things when I plug in my hair dryer, which I do use. And to have something wireless, it's a little thing. But I know there's <laughs> there are some people out there that are nodding their heads like, Oh, if there just wasn't that cord kind of like bumping into other stuff, like knocking things over. That's cool. Yeah, indeed. Chinese platforms like JD.com are seeing a significant increase in activity around telemedicine providers. And The Economist notes that JD.com itself arose during the SARS epidemic in 2003 when its founder, Richard Liu, decided to shut down physical locations of electronic stores when people were not leaving the house that time and move them online, starting JD.com, which is huge now. Uh, there's also other telemedicine advances happening around the world. Legislation signed in the U.S. Friday expands the coverage of telemedicine by Medicare. Uh, telemedicine is covered by Medicare for rural residents visiting specialists that are far away, but those restrictions are now waived in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, if you're in an area with the outbreak. Uh, a survey by Software Advice found that 84% of patients are more likely to choose a provider who offers telemedicine over one who doesn't. And a couple other things, Lariat.net in Wyoming is offering free internet service to telehealth providers uh, to help them increase their capacity. And UC Health Virtual Agent Care, Urgent Care in Colorado uh, is offering telemedicine uh, for a flat fee of $49 if your insurance or, or Medicare doesn't cover it. Uh, so we're seeing a, a lot of expansion there. And, and I asked Patrick to kind of look into to telemedicine in Europe, uh, and you found out that it's it's been recognized for a while, but it's fairly new in coverage, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, I, I've never used it, and I honestly don't know anyone that has used it. This might change now in, in you know, the next few weeks and months. But uh, it's been recognized as a practice, as you said, for about a decade um, in the law. But uh, the important part of it is, was it covered by uh, the healthcare system that we have? And it turns out that was implemented about a year and a half ago, about towards the end of uh, 2018. So it's something that wasn't prompted by the latest outbreak, but uh, it's been, you know, uh, uh, something that the government has investigated and possibly is pushing for because it has a lot of advantages, obviously. It's not something that you're going to want to use uh, for every type of uh, medical care you need, but they have a, a fairly, it seems they're doing a fairly good job at cataloging the different cases where uh, it could be used and, and things like that. So um, I think this is an example of 
things being well thought out in advance. And I guess that because the system is already in place, uh, it's going to see a lot of use now uh, in the next few months. Yeah, especially with COVID-19, uh, you don't want to expose yourself to others or others to you if you do have it. Uh, if you don't have it, you don't want to go into an office where someone might have it and you might catch it. So telemedicine is more important than usual in this particular case. Exactly, yeah. Tell us about uh, Amsterdam. Yes, <laughs> I will. I shall. Amsterdam's cloud communication platform, MessageBird, introduced Inbox.ai, which lets uh, customers communicate with a business through WhatsApp, SMS, Voice, Messenger, Instagram, WeChat, Apple Business Chat, RCS, Line, and Telegram. Yes, that list is long. In Inbox.ai an analyzes keywords to suggest replies, handle auto replies, and route messages. It supports text, image, images, video, geolocation, and more. It also integrates with uh, third-party uh, apps like Shopify, Slack, Salesforce, Jira, and more. Founder and CEO Robert Viss, I guess that's how you pronounce his name, also said that Inbox.ai wants to solve the message continuity problem where you have to re-deliver information to agents multiple times as you are handed off from one to another. It's free to use inbound messages with pricing per outbound message or plans uh, of $50 to $150 a month to cover most needs. This, I think, it has the potential to really shake up uh, customer service because uh, yeah. instead of having one or two ways uh, to to handle incoming calls and having to assign them to people like you're on the text messaging, you're on the phone bank. Uh, you can just put everybody on on this if it if it works as advertised, and the customer can choose however they want to interact with you, and all their information will be integrated together. And and what you said about continuity, I mean that's a huge complaint I know a lot of people have, which is I just told the previous person everything, or I, I texted you mm -hmm. and, or emailed you all of this. That's why I'm on the phone with you. Do you not have that in front of you? No, sir. I'm sorry. Can you please do that again? If this could just, just help solve that, uh, it would be absolutely worth it. And one of, one of yeah. the things that I didn't think was super clear from the article, but I assume is, is the way that this works is let's say I'm on Instagram and I want to talk to, I don't know, my telco that would be through the DM feature of Instagram going to the telco's account, and then that goes into yeah. inbox.ai. Yeah, I don't think it's through public posts. That wouldn't make any sense, no. right? Well, so, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I guess just it mean, has to be, right? It, it's a, it's I, not some other account that you'd have well, to Instagram know about. Well, Instagram has some business accounts where they, they can handle business communications. I assume it's through that. Got it. But it, it could probably, and I guess would, integrate um, the thread that you started the conversation sure. uh, with that might be public. This is the, I, I'm guessing, because mm. the beauty of all of this is that it can, it's kind of a, I don't know, Zapier or if this, then that of communication mm. where it, it manages to put everything in the format that you want. And it's a thing that I think everyone kind of needed in that field, everyone kind of needed, but no one got out and actually did it. And uh, I, I, I agree with you. It seems like it's going to be tremendously helpful. And the pricing doesn't seem, I mean, to me, it seems kind of low. So I think it will improve, of course, the life of the lives of um, CS representatives, but possibly also our own. Yeah, and, and like many of these services, if it if it, if you're an enterprise, you don't pay $150 a month. You contact them directly, and they come up with a suitable plan for you. Uh, so there's a there's a limit on that $150 a month, but but even then, yeah, I agree with yeah, you, Patrick. The price per per interaction seems. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I checked it out, and it seems quite low. Uh, but I mean, I I'm not a specialist of this, but uh, if if it solves a problem that you have as a business and uh, helps your relationship with your customer, I think it's worth money. And I I, I bet that's what inbox.ai is, is betting on. Curious to see how this works. Jane Manchin Wong discovered code in the Facebook for Android app, indicating that Facebook is testing the option to cross post Facebook stories to Instagram. Facebook told TechCrunch it is indeed testing the feature. Users have been able to do the opposite, going from Instagram to Facebook and cross posting stories since 2017. So, man, 
few years later, but not really a surprise that they would go uh, vice versa in this case. TechCrunch's Josh Constein also points out this could let Facebook sync up already viewed content to prevent reruns. We all hate those. Well, maybe you don't, but I do. When you've already looked at Facebook stories and then you check Instagram and you see the same thing and you're like, oh, should I like it again? I already liked it in one place. No, I already liked it in one place, et cetera. Anybody I, yeah, happy? Yeah, I, I, I don't use, I mean, I look at Instagram stories from time to time. I've, I, I don't know when the last time I looked at a Facebook story is, so I'm absolutely the wrong target market. Uh, but I feel Josh Constein and your pain. Uh, if you're, you're seeing stuff in one place and then you go to another place and you see the same stuff again, you're like, I already saw this. I don't need to see it again. Uh, right. so, so yeah, if they sync that up, uh, for, for people who use both features frequently, it seems like a good move. Yeah, I Facebook and Instagram, yes, they're different platforms, but they're so they 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 become less more and more seamless as time goes on. And I do see a lot of the same content and it's not the end of the world, but it would be nice for the platform to be able to know that particularly if I've already engaged with something, uh don't show it to me again wherever wherever it has been cross posted. There, there's definitely a logical reasoning behind doing this, and it makes sense. It's cleaner because a lot of things are already synced, messages and, uh, I mean, many other things, comments, stuff like that. Um, it, it does beg the question, though, of is this also part of Facebook integrating everything together so that they can never be, uh, uh, you know, broken into separate companies? But uh, th This is not, I, I mean, I know what you mean. They're not this doing this feature design. so they won't get broken into separate companies. Exactly. But doing things like this further integrates everything and makes it harder to separate it out. Although I, I think the chances of them ever getting separated into separate companies are low. It's more about like when you're in one ecosystem, now you're in all their ecosystems, whether you right. want to be or not. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. We've seen, uh, we actually talked yesterday uh, about one of the leaks coming out of iOS 14, uh, where uh, folks are looking at the source code and finding uh, indications of features that are coming uh, from 9 to 5 Mac, which has been doing a, a lot of the legwork on this. Uh, we know about those mouse pad features, uh, the improved mouse features beyond just accessibility, trackpad gestures. We talked about that yesterday, but also triple lens camera display on the iPad. So the iPad might have a time of flight 3D sensor, a wide angle lens, an ultra wide lens, and a telephoto lens. And on iOS, uh, they're finding evidence of an augmented reality app codenamed Gobi uh, that is testing in Apple stores and at Starbucks, apparently. Not sure what you would use an augmented reality for in Starbucks, but I, I'm sure there are plenty of reasons. Uh, there's indications that the next cheap iPhone, uh, some people call it the iPhone 9, some people call it the SE2, we don't know what the official name might end up to be, uh, would have Touch ID and Express Transit. Express Transit is the thing that lets you tap your phone against the fare gate when you're boarding uh, or going into the train area without having to unlock your phone every time. Uh, but the one that's got everybody excited today is a new home screen page that shows all your installed app icons in a list view. Uh, Android users will call this the app drawer. It's very similar to that, the way it sounds. Uh, and you'd be able to sort that list by unread notifications. So any app that has an unread notification could be at the top. Uh, you could say, show me the most used. So go from most frequently used to the least used or vice versa. Uh, and also there are some Siri suggestions based on time of day and location that might show up. You kind of see these when you swipe left in iOS right now. Uh, but I think these would like put things at the top of your list based on, oh, you're at the gym. We know you probably want your music and this fitness app. And, and so we'll put those at the top uh, right now because it's that time of day and we see the location you're at. Uh, there, there's also some other features here, but before we move on to some of the things in Apple TV and some of the others, uh, what do y'all think of this? Love the new home screen icon list. Uh, I love the idea of it getting a little bit smarter about my habits. <laughs> Not every day is exactly the same for me, but I'm kind of a creature of habits. So yes, the the um, example that you said, Tom, about being at the gym, yeah, like put that podcast app right at the top. You know it's 10. That's kind of when Sarah goes on a walk with her dog, that sort of thing. I love the idea of being able to sort more easily. I have a lot of apps on my phone, and I'm okay at searching. That's That works fine. But... I like the idea of having another way to 
to sort through apps very much the way that I I use Mac OS, uh, the Finder. I mean, it's not going to be the same, but it feels more similar to that than what I've had in the past, and I'm looking forward to it. You can also apparently pin apps that will not get closed or get prioritized, which uh, could be interesting on iOS because I don't know if it's my iPhone 10, which is getting old, mm. but it seems that uh, the moment I, I switch to another app, the first one is gone. Bye-bye. I have to restart anything I was doing there. I'm exaggerating, but barely. Um, <laughs> and and I know you discussed the, the mouse features on the iPad, which might uh, appear actually on the iPad, not just on the iPad Pro, but um, it, it, it's, it does beg to, the question to me, do, how much like a PC do we want the iPad to be? Um, it now has a file system, which is not a full-fledged file system, but fairly close to it. And if it has uh, uh, solid mouse features, we already have PCs or PC-like tablets. Do you want the iPad to be that too? I'm over. I'm exaggerating a little bit because it's still touch first and all of that. But it, it, I think the question comes into reality. Yeah, I mean, it'll make the iPad. It'll take away one more thing. That's what I've said before. One more thing that stops me from using the iPad as a laptop replacement, uh, which is, oh, well, I've got that fast mouse thing. Uh, and iPad OS is getting some more multi-window type. Uh, uh, management, but it yeah, still but doesn't the, match. Um, What's that? The point is, the point is, if the thing that gets you to use the iPad as a laptop re replacement is to make the iPad into a laptop, kind of without a keyboard, then what's the point of the iPad? You know. Well, it's a touchscreen laptop. Then it's a smaller yeah, touchscreen laptop for people who want a smaller form factor than what you yeah. get uh, with the MacBook, and uh, and it's a little more lightweight. So just a light PC then. The, 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 it was supposed to be more than that. And maybe it still is. I don't know. It was supposed to be something completely new. And I, it feels like it's drifting towards. Anyway, that's a different conversation. I want it to be more like a laptop for me to be able Actually, to use I it. Do. Actually, yeah. I do too. And I think yeah. it's a medium. It's a happy <laughs> medium that would be useful. But yeah. uh, Also, a couple other things. Mac Rumors identified a fitness app code named Seymour. Uh, that would not just be on iOS, tvOS, or watchOS, but all three. Uh, so you could use it on your TV, through your Apple TV. Your watch could sort of like prompt you through exercises, or you could just be watching it on your phone. And uh, it would have guided fitness-related videos. The Mac Rumors article said we don't see any indication that they would even charge for any of this stuff. It would just be a free thing for people who own Apple devices. Uh, that's cool because right now the good stuff you do have to pay for, which is not that I don't feel like exercise should be paid for, but, uh, otherwise you're kind of like searching for like weird yoga videos on YouTube. So I would love this. <laughs> I, you know, I have to say, uh, have, having watched Eileen search for weird yoga videos uh, <laughs> or free apps that she can use and airplay from her phone, once she got the Peloton, that uh, that all went away because now Peloton has stuff that she can put on the Apple TV or through actually just airplay through from her iPhone as well as stuff that's on the bike, uh, and it's all part of that subscription. We we talked about the fact that SoulCycle uh, is going to be offering that. Uh, there's there's an app mm -hmm. that'll be playing with the new Soul Cycle. Like it makes sense for Apple to get in on this game, but are we going to get the same complaint of like, wait a minute, now Apple is competing with other people on their platform, and is right. that fair? Uh, of course we are, and I think that discussion should happen. Yeah, but it's not going to stop Apple from doing it. <laughs> Uh, a few more th things that are bubbling up in, in iOS 14 uh, research, uh, detective work. These are, again, from 9 to 5 Mac. Uh, new Apple TV box and a new remote. We knew about the yeah! box. I'm not sure we heard about the remote, but yeah, exactly. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be better than this. Yes. Sarah's Old cheers tier, are yeah. representing the world. Don't there. know how, how good it's going to be. I like the Apple TV remote, but I'm the exception. Uh, I'm, I'm also the exception, but I also don't mind a new remote. It would be fine if they came up with a new one. Uh, and then AirTags will have a user-replaceable battery. Uh, you'll be able to set them up in bulk through iOS, play a sound to help you locate them, and track through AR on the latest iPhone. 
Uh, so that's what that AR app uh, could be useful is when you leave your phone in the Starbucks, you can use the AR app to find <laughs> it. Uh, I guess you wouldn't need a ta air tag for that. So maybe your backpack with the air tag when you've left it. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, it sounds like by the end of this year, we're finally going to get that air tags thing that we've been hearing about in rumors forever. The user replaceable battery thing, um, it, there are some, it would be a, a, a little uh, CR2032, mm -hmm. those things. Um, they do exist in rechargeable form, so it could be useful there. But uh, competitive competitors uh, to that not existing product have versions with which use these kinds of batteries that last for about a year. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't need to change it every couple of months. So that's that's a great uh, uh, feature as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, Apple News. It was at the top of the subreddit today, unsurprisingly. Great minds think alike. You could submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Kevin Eden, PhD, wrote in about a conversation we were having on Good Day Internet yesterday. Tom said, I ate an MRE for lunch. I was like, what's that? Kevin says, I'm a chief software architect during the day, but a 17-year Army officer in the reserves. I'm a major, and I and I love the show. You oh. recently talked about MREs in the GDI intro. That was, you know, we'd do an intro and outro uh, around Good Day Internet every day. First, for Roger, there are Chili Mac MREs, which, in my biased opinion, are the best. Second, those drinks that you didn't use are for salt replenishment. Think about being in the jungle or the desert. Mm -hmm. You're sweating. You need those salts back. During three tours in Afghanistan, those MREs kept me going. In any emergency situation, I'm sure they will supply life-sustaining needs. Honestly, as much flack as the Army gets for their cooking, the MREs aren't nearly as bad as their reputation. They provide the calories and nutrition needed to survive and carry out whatever tasks are needed. I honestly enjoy some of them. I love that. And I, I have one of the Chili Macs. I checked my my crate. Uh, so, Roger, I don't know. You want me to send you one? I, I, I can't. <laughs> I'll let you taste it first. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Major Dr. Kevin H. Eaton. Uh, that, that is awesome. I appreciate that, that insight on uh, that. I emailed Kevin back and I told him, like, I, my MRE history goes back when I had a roommate in Austin back in the mid-90s who was an Army reservist. And he would sometimes, after maneuvers, bring back leftover MREs in the old cardboard boxes. Uh, they seem to have improved since then. <laughs> thanks, Kevin, uh, and thanks to everybody who uh, gives us feedback every day. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Ken Hayes, Brad Schick, and Paul Boyer. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja. Patrick, what has been going on in your world? Uh, if you want to listen to my podcast, just check out Frenchspin.com. But if you want to uh, see the beauty of stories in, on Instagram, uh, just Follow me on Instagram. I'm not Patrick over there. I've been uh, fairly active. And I think it's a really fun. I know most people who listen to podcasts are into Twitter. Instagram deserves your attention. Mm. It's uh, a growing network of, you know, a billion people. But <laughs> it's a growing little <laughs> network of a billion people. <laughs> not Patrick on Instagram. I think you'll enjoy what I do. Excellent. Uh, also, folks, since uh, late last year, we've had discount codes uh, for the Daily Tech News Show store as part of our patron rewards. But Patreon just made it a lot easier for you to find them. You can find them in your member benefits now. Uh, patrons should have gotten an automatic email today uh, as I set up the new functionality. But yeah, you can get 5% off anything in the store uh, with a special Patreon code. Or at certain levels, you can actually not only get 5% off, but also free shipping. Uh, you get a free shipping code at the master and grandmaster level. So if you want to find out a little bit more about that, head on over to patreon.com slash DTNS. I mentioned that we love feedback and a great way is to email us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>